CG Ruthless Sports. I will be brutally honest. Ain't nothing but being brutally honest. Coming at you with another video. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome former Raiders safety, Detroit Lions safety, and most of all played in, with the New York Giants and former Purdue standout, Stuart Swagger. How's it going, bro? Hey, what's going on, man? Hey, thanks for having me on. I, I know we've kind of had a couple of times where the, the schedule didn't work, so I'm pumped to be on. Oh, dude, it's I've been pumped for it for quite some time, man. But speaking of quite some time, man, like, you know, a lot of people – aren't really familiar with you from the time, but describe who you are, man. Tell everybody who you are, man. Well, you know, uh, so I'm from, from uh, Saginaw, Michigan. Um, you know, I was a three-sport athlete in Saginaw, uh, Saginaw Heritage High School. I I played football, ran track, and I uh, played basketball. Then I went on to uh, Purdue University, where I was a four-year starter. My, uh, my freshman year, we uh, won the Big Ten. I was uh, – uh, Big Ten. As a true freshman, I was Big Ten Freshman of the Year. I led the team in interceptions and tackles. Uh, Drew Brees was on that team. Drew Brees was a former teammate of mine. Uh, we played the Rose Bowl against Washington. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't win the game, but uh, it was a, a great experience. Then I went on to play uh, the next year against Washington State in the Sun Bowl, and then Washington again in the in the Sun Bowl. And then my senior year, we played Georgia in the Capital One Bowl. Uh, played with a lot of great teammates. I want to say my senior year, we had 11 guys. Uh, I see, yeah, 11 guys drafted in the NFL, seven of us off defense. I uh, was a third round pick to the uh, to the Oakland Raiders, uh, third pick in the third round. Uh, played four years for Oakland. I think I started, I think 54, 55 games out there for Oakland. Uh, finished. Uh, then I went and played for the Redskins, the Giants, finished my NFL career with the Detroit Lions. And then I went on to play three seasons in the United Football League for the Omaha Nighthawks, which was a really cool league. Uh, you know, uh, Jeff Garcia was actually our quarterback, uh, you know, with linebackers like Cato June, Dante Culpepper was in the league. So it was a lot of former NFL players and coaches in that league. Uh, in 2011, I was the United Football League's Defensive Player of the Year. I led the team in uh, or led the league in interceptions and tackles. I uh, finished my NFL career, I think, with, I don't know, maybe 380 tackles. I think four interceptions, I think four forced fumbles, five fumble recoveries. Uh, so I had a pretty decent career. Then I went on and uh, went lived back in Saginaw, Michigan with my family. Uh, I married my wife. Uh, or I, I, obviously, I married my wife, but I married my girlfriend from Purdue. Uh, we've been together for 22 years now, uh, married for 14. I have four amazing children, Cameron, who is 14, Emma, who is nine, Alex, who is five, uh, and then my youngest daughter is three and a half. During that time between um, when I was finished at 31 till I was 37, I owned an indoor football team called the Saginaw Sting uh, for four seasons. We went to three championships, won two of them. Um, for two years, I was the co I, I actually bought the league that the team played in called the Continental Indoor Football League. Uh, we had, let's see, uh, ten. No, we had uh, ten teams in six states that I was in charge of. I owned a limousine company during that time. I also had a, a training business called Impact Training by Stuart Schweiger. Then in tw uh, 2017, I moved down to uh, about 2015. I started to notice some changes with my 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 decision making. And so I started to get involved in the NFL concussion lawsuit. I had a workers comp claim out in California. Um, I was uh, also you know, going through um, 
some other NFL programs or whatnot. So I had a lot of testing done and come to find out during those testings, I probably had over 50 to 60 concussions. So, you know, I was struggling with anxiety, depression, PTSD, uh, pain management, not being able to sleep, uh, uh, you know, impulse control, uh, memory, a lot of that stuff. So I started to sell off my businesses and we moved down. And because of that, I just kind of wanted to focus on my mental health. So we, we actually moved down to uh, West Lafayette, Indiana, uh, in the Saginaw area. You know, you have Michigan here, you have Detroit, Flint and Saginaw on I-75 and kind of when the auto industry fell apart, those areas just really got, the economy fell apart, uh, crime rose. And I wanted the best opportunity for my kids. And down here in West Lafayette, Indiana, I mean, the high schools are, the high school they go to, which is West Lafayette, is number one in the state. I think top five in the in the country for education. And my wife's a nurse, so she could get any job she wanted as far as, you know, in the health departments. And I had a radio station down here, 1017 The Hammer, uh, where we focused on Purdue sports, local sports. I did that for a little while. And then um, I was actually the – I stopped doing that, and then I was the uh, facilities coordinator at YMCA. And then, again, I started to – again, with the with the mental issues from the concussions, I, I was struggling with that. So I decided to uh, apply for uh, total and permanent disability, which I was awarded – about two years ago. So as of right now, I'm just a stay at home dad uh, of four kids. Um, and uh, it was really cool. About two months ago, I was inducted into the uh, Purdue Sports Athletic Hall of Fame. And uh, it was a, it was a great accomplishment for me. Uh, There's a running back named Leroy Keys that played for Purdue back in the, in the late 60s. And uh, he was twice runner up for the Heisman his junior and senior year. I think his senior year he ended up getting beat out by OJ Simpson. But he was a he was a guy that came back to Purdue and a very close friend of mine and it was kind of nice because uh the the Hall of Fame actually was renamed the Leroy Keys Purdue Athletic Hall of Fame. So his family was there for the renaming of it and we were the first class uh to get inducted into it and I'll just read this this is kind of cool it says <clears throat> It says, Hall of Famer, three words defined as the best and brightest. In Purdue history, there have been more than 9,250 student-athletes, coaches, and administrators. Purdue's Hall of Fame consists of 175 inductees, meaning less than 2% of all Boilermakers are enriched. So it's a pretty elite group. And kind of my last my last kind of thing I wanted to accomplish on my like for myself about five or six years ago, I, I, I kind of make this analogy that I, I had to bury uh, Stuart Swaggart, the athlete. You know, those uh, those days of me accomplishing something on my own, like, you know, making it to the Super Bowl or, 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 or you know, becoming a Hall of Famer in the NFL or, or coaching in the Super Bowl or just certain things that I wanted to accomplish in my, my, my playing career. I had to realize that those days were over with. And I always say I, I mourned that player. You know, it took me a while to – to, to buy or not buy in, but it took me a while to, to really like know that those times were done. And, and once that happened now, I mean, me kind of mentoring some athletes and, 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 and giving advice to my kids and watching them be successful with it um, makes me happier than anything I could do individually. But this was kind of my last individual thing I wanted to accomplish. And I've done that. And uh, life's, mm -hmm. never, life's never been better the last two years. I mean, me and my wife's relationship is great. My relationship with my kids, but there were, a, there was a time where for about four or five years, it was a struggle because of, you know, my, my brain, basically you, you think of, think of doing something and operating and, and uh, the way you handle things for 33, 34 years when all of a sudden it switches. And now you don't handle situations the same way you used to. You don't think the same way you used to. You don't, I, I kind of contribute my brain because there's damage to the prefrontal cortex and, and with that damage, my brain's pretty much the brain of a 18 or 19 year old kid. You know, uh, you, you, you kind of, uh, like I said, you're impulsive. Uh, you don't think of consequences. Um, you just so, take the hits. You just take a lot of the hits, a lot of the risk factors and all that stuff. So yeah. when you play this game, it's pretty much like you're putting your health at risk. So the fact that you had some, concussions, Absolutely. yeah, the fact that you had some concussions throughout your career, you had to think, mentally in the right mind maybe it was better for you to step away and it had to be the toughest decision just to 
move forward from your playing days. But when you look back at Purdue, man, you had the record for the most interceptions. Yeah, yeah. The the the, the former record was held by uh, Rod Woodson, who is a uh, a mentor of mine, uh, a close friend of mine, a guy that I respect a ton. Um, the the record was eleven. I actually tied that my sophomore year, and then I finished it with seventeen. And one of the other things that I'm really happy, and I also think I finished, I think I'm like seventh or eighth all time for tackles there. And I think second all time for safeties uh, for tackles. But one of the things too, is I, I, I graduated in three and a half years at Purdue um, and uh, with a 3.1 GPA. So that was the other thing, you know, I, I never had any issues with, you know, um, you know, with schooling or concentration or none of this stuff. And also now, when I'm going to do these testings and everything, you know, you're basically kind of doing IQ tests and I'm struggling with, with things that I thought, you know, I'm, I'm looking back thinking I could, I could have aced these things when I was probably in middle school or in high school. And I'm, I'm sitting here struggling with this stuff. So it was a, it was a, a tough transitional period. And, and, and really now through therapy, through medication, through a lot of, a lot of communication with my family and my wife and understanding and trying to figure out, um, basically how to live a, a normal life with these new unnormal brain issues. So, but we've, we've got it pretty much figured out now. Um, I'm, I'm, con- you know, constantly still, uh, uh, um, it, it's never something that's over with. So I'm always in kind of a period of, of learning about new things. And also one thing I took upon myself about two years ago was to contact former teammates of mine and friends of mine and see how they're doing. I mean, you see, Felt like last year for a time there, it was like every three or four months I was losing a former teammate or a, a guy I played against or a guy I played with. And uh, a lot of times it's it's these guys, the, they don't know what's going on. Uh, their wives and, and, and family don't know what's going on. Uh, by that time, you know, five or six years after they're done is when you start to see some of these these issues come up. And, you know, all of a sudden now they, they're struggling with some money. They're trying to go back and get a regular job and they can't because – Again, they just don't operate the way that, you know, people in a normal workforce operate. And then they just, they just kind of, they kind of seclude themselves and uh, stop talking to people. And that's the worst thing you can do, you know, cause they feel like they're the only ones going through it. And there's a lot of guys going through it. So I've, I've tried to reach out to as many people as I can. And, and, you know, two years ago got reassociated really with the Raiders. I hadn't, I hadn't communicated with the Raiders in like 10 years and I couldn't watch NFL football. Um, and then I, I finally just decided, I talked to one of my teammates. He said, come back. And the Raiders do a phenomenal job with the alumni. Um, so I've been going back the last two years and, and reconnecting with guys. And, and it's been amazing to be able to kind of form that network. So that's pretty much kind of from from when I started until to kind of catch us up here until today. Yeah, I mean, you've done it all. And I guess you repaired the relationship with the team with the Raiders. So you got a lot of people you work with the network. I've seen you work with a lot of these guys and we've interacted from time to time. And uh, I've always thought, man, Hey, if a guy can do so much and he, he does support for all the other contents, man, that speaks volume. And plus you're just more than just a a guy that used to play in the NFL. You're a guy that has the mental mindset. Like when you play this game, you played it with with an edge, but you, (laughs) you knew you're, you were taking the consequences with the risk. <clears throat> and that's, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, during that time <clears throat> in high school, I missed one game for an ankle. In college, I missed one game for a, uh, a sprained knee. And in the NFL, I missed one game for a, a torn calf. So I was a guy that I, I prided myself on being, you know, being healthy and, and taking care of my body. And one of the things is I say this, I say, you know, and, and really back then that kind of towards the end of my career is when they kind of started to, you know, when that movie came out, when they finally started to kind of recognize that guys were having these issues, you know, I I thought a concussion was when you got knocked out, right? Like when you're laying on the turf and they have to come and cart you off. What, what I didn't think was a concussion when when they call it just getting your bell rung. Right. You know, I, I remember I was getting them um, a lot. My third year in the NFL was almost every game. And, I would have deja vu where I thought I had been there before. And then I would, I would see like sparkles or stars going through my eyes. And I, I really couldn't see too well. I, I mean, if the ball was going to fly in the air, I probably couldn't see the ball, but I could come up and make tackles. And I actually had a little sign uh, that I would give to Kirk Morrison, our middle linebacker, where I kind of, ta- I would tap my leg 
and he knew to, to, to kind of hold me up in the huddle so I wasn't swinging like this because I'd say this, about 5%, and, and this is just kind of my own, it's not I did any studies on this, but 5 or 10% of the NFL makes 5 and 10% of the money, or, or sorry, 90% of the money. So what I mean by that is the 100 guys that people know, you know, the, the guys whose jerseys are up in the stores and guys who are, you know, kind of the faces of the team, those guys are making the huge, huge, huge contracts, right? And the other, the other guys like us, you know, and those guys have job security. So if those guys were to get hurt, they know that when they come back, they're going to get their job back. For the rest of us, you know, if I if I get a concussion and I I tell them I have one, I'm out that game, and then you have to do the you know the protocol. I'm probably out the next game. Well, during that time, <clears throat> my position's up. You know, I mean, someone could come in. And again, I'm not one of those 10 percenters that has that job security. So I'm not going to I'm not going to allow anyone to come in and take my spot. So if I'm not knocked out and I can still play, I'm going to play. And, you know, whereas now and even back then you talk to the trainer, you know, it's your trainer sitting there and he's asking you, hey, are you good to go? And, you know, all the questions are going to ask. So you can you can BS it. Right. I mean, at the time. Most players didn't want to lose their position, like you yeah. said, and, and the concussions then weren't like monitor as much. You know, it was like if they checked on you for a little bit, you can go. If not, concussions during that time was pretty rare. Like you said, you were dazed up, like you would have to communicate with your teammate, and he would get yep. the clue. But for you, you didn't want to lose your job to any other veteran or any other rookie, so you were trying to do your best you can just to stay on the field and say, yeah. You know what? And, well, and then too, you're, 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 you're thinking, well, you know, if there's issues, I'll deal with, you know, you're, again, you're just, you're, you're in this position where uh, you want to try to play as long as you can. And you're thinking, uh, it, I'll just worry about that stuff later, you know? So, I mean, you're going to, again, you practice so hard and you, and you, and you, all of, all of the preparation for these games, you only get 16 of them during the, during a whole year. So uh, again, I'm not going to miss any of those because the name of the game is to make plays, right? To go out there and, and, and show your fans that you appreciate them and, and, and put out good performances. And if you're not out there, you're not doing what you want to do. Uh, so I was, like I said, I was going to do anything I could to stay out there. And, and uh, uh, there wasn't that education and what could actually happen from some of these effects. You know, what, what did it, if I would have known about, you know, a little bit more about where, where, uh, where what, what happens, I wouldn't have changed anything. I still would have played. But I think now, like when a guy would go out, because you see a guy at practice, right, or during the week, and you're thinking, well, are you going to play this week? No, you know, I'm still – and you're like, you're still struggling from something that happened, you know, a week ago because you, I mean, you have a headache? Like it – it almost – you almost kind of look down on the player because we just – we're just thinking like this guy needs to get going here, you know? Whereas now, when, when they decide if you can play or not, it's a third party. Like, you know, you have – you have, you know, you have the, the, let's say you have the Raiders trainers and you have the 49ers trainers and they're playing when, a, when a guy up top, there's a group that says, Hey, I think this guy has a concussion. Well, he comes down and he says, Hey, you can play or you can't play. It's not up to the player. It's not up to the coaches. It's not up to the trainers. It's this third party. So when that happens, it's, it's a little more understanding because it, it's, it's saying like, Hey, this guy's telling me I can't play. But as a, as a player, someone's going to give you that option. Hey, you think you can play or not? Every player is going to say, yeah, I, I can play. And they kind of put it in your hand. So back then, if you said you couldn't play, it's like this guy's saying he can't play because he got his bell rung uh, like two weeks ago. And, and now it takes the players out of it, which I think is good. And also, too, in the lower levels, if you have so many of them, you can't go anymore. So it's to where you a player can't look back and go, man, I decided not to play. Did I make the right decision or not? Well, now it's not up to you. So if it happens, it's kind of you're not going to sit there and have those regrets about it. So I think they're they're making some advancements to it. But again, you know, football is football. It's it, it's a it's a sport that people like because there is that physicality to it. So you can you can only you can only make it as safe as much before it doesn't become football anymore. Oh, absolutely, dude. Like the risk factor, but now they're more cautious about it. Like, like you said, that there's a third party when it comes to the injuries. It's not up to the coaches or the players. Yes. It could be that third party. Before then, it was more like they would give you the participation if you show up or not. Yep. yep. They didn't have none, they didn't double check or none. <laughs> no, it was no, like it was different times. But like but I do want to I do want to say this too. So, you know, during that time, 
when I was struggling, so I, I stopped. I didn't, I didn't like going out in public. I didn't like to travel, uh, the anxiety, being out where, you know, before, if you know, if you're out in public and you hear knuckleheads talking and, and you can just kind of ignore them and, and just move on. Well, well, now for me, I don't have that kind of that filter anymore. I, I have to say something and, and I've gotten myself in situations where, you know, probably I'm, 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 I'm creating situations that are unsafe for me out in public. So I stopped going out um, and it got to the point where I wasn't socializing. And when you stop socializing, that's when you start to get in your own head and you start to um, think that you're the only one with these issues. And, 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 and you know, Doc's and, you know, Graphic, um, when he asked me to come on his show, I really didn't know anything about the social media stuff. You know, I mean, I had seen it a little bit, but um, again, I remember during my career, you have you in, in a, as a football player. You, you only talk about the corrections. Like you don't talk about the good plays you have. You talk about the plays that you need to, that the, maybe the mistakes that you made and the plays you need to work on. So again, as far as fans go, you don't think of the, the hundreds or thousands or however many fans that, that support you. It's the couple of fans that were the ones that were talking crap to you or the ones that would write bad articles about you. So you, you think that one, one bad article or one fan represents the whole the whole nation or the whole NFL or whatever. So you're, you're almost kind of embarrassed to go out because you do talk to people and, Oh, I never heard of you. And, or you only played this many years or you didn't win a super bowl. So you just almost stop even talking about it. I didn't wear anything from the Raiders. I didn't do any of that stuff. But when I got on Graf's show and kind of got reintroduced, uh, cause I, I was nervous about doing it. I'm like, man, having people make comments. I'm thinking, dude, people are going to be, and I'm just going to get upset and I'm, I'm going to get mad. And, it was completely different. So getting on this social media and, ha and, and getting on shows like yours and being able to talk to the nation and talk to fans from other teams, it really saved my life. I mean, it did because now I can come on here and be social and interact with people and and get that interaction with with without having to leave my house. With Yeah, you get that normal reaction. You feel... You feel like home in a bit because yeah, you're where I'm not, there. I'm not out. I'm I'm safe. I feel comfortable in my house. And you know, two years ago, if you were to tell me me and you could have this conversation across the computer screen, yeah, I would be thinking the same way too. Because uh, I never before during the draft days, man, the interviews were different. But now yeah. I get I get that platform to interview any NFL draft prospects, man. It's like. Dude, I I thought about I never thought of it in so many years, bro. I would have the likes of Julian Peterson. I would yeah. have the likes of Sean King and you. Dude, it's like I can go on, bro. I like to reach for those big names, bro. But, <laughs> but you told me you got a couple of guys that you got in mind, bro. What what about giving me that that assassin George Atkinson, man? I got to get him on, man. That that's gonna be big. Yeah, I know. So yeah, so George George is a is a is a very close friend of mine. Um, that was one thing cool about the Raiders. And they that, got history. That was one thing also, too, is um, when I was drafted, uh, Willie Brown, you know, one of the greatest ever. Rest um, in peace. Yes, thank you. Was um, He was a guy, uh, like when I talked about Leroy Keys from Purdue, kind of a guy that was a, a, a legend for us. Wasn't, a, wasn't like a, a coach coach. So you felt like you could go to him, you know, with, with problems you probably wouldn't talk to with um, – the real cool. Oh, and actually, let me let me just rewind to another reason you didn't talk about injuries and, and concussions. You didn't want to have it on your report. Yeah. You didn't want to have that on your biography because when you become a free agent and all of a sudden there, it comes down to two guys and you're looking at your, you know, they're looking at your report and you, you say that you had, a, you've had a couple concussions, you've had this, you've had that. And then this other guy doesn't have any injuries, which everybody has injuries. It's just, you just don't report them because again, you look at it and you go, well, we're going to take this guy because he's got a healthier background. So guys like Willie Brown were guys that you could come up and maybe talk to a little bit about personal issues. Because, again, you didn't bring up any issues with coaches because they're going to go up and they're going to tell tell somebody. And then all of a sudden now they're like, hey, man, we might want to get rid of this guy. He's talking about he's depressed. You know, he doesn't want to get up. He's fighting with his girlfriend. He's he's having all these weird issues. And and. That just that just makes you look bad as a player, which is unfortunate. And now, like I said, that's a little bit different. But Willie Brown, when, at the so we get drafted on a Saturday, and that that Thursday they had us fly out, and we had a, a full team mini camp. It wasn't 
it wasn't like this stuff now where it's a rookie mini camp or it's, uh, you know, half the team or whatever. This is everybody there. And I remember Willie Brown had all the rookies come in. And uh, I mean, by, I mean, you know, it was, I think just the draft of rookies he had. So, you know what, nine, 10 of us. And he, he said, put down your pads, put down your playbooks. And he, he held up like the Raiders. Um, it was like the history of the Raiders. It was like a, basically like a, like a little like yearbook. Like a tradition, like give you yeah. a little pep talk and tell you how it's done and all that type yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Most so, veterans yeah. most veterans, or the people who've been around the legends, like you get guys like like you said, Willie Brown, then you have Ronnie Lott passing dollars with yes. the Niners. Yes. Yeah, you get one of those guys. And and so he reads it. He says, guys, he says, put your playbooks down. He says, go home, go in your room tonight and study this. He said, this is what's important right now. He said, for one, I want you to read through this and read about the players that won, that had this organization win three Super Bowls, the legends. Read about who they are and what they had to do to accomplish those goals. You know, what type of stats did these guys have? What type of careers did these guys have? And he said, secondly, these guys are going to be around here. And he says, when you see these guys, you go up and you pay your respects to these guys. So that always stuck with me. And when you talk about the Raiders, you know, you had Fred Blitnikoff with the wide receivers and you had Jim Otto in there and you had, uh, you know, you'd have these guys, George Atkinson and, and Jack Tatum. And these guys would come back. And I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, if I was at mini, if I was at training camp and I'm a safety and I got, Jack Tatum there watching practice. Cause these guys would come and watch practice, right? This guy's watching practice and I don't like come up and just pay my respects to him. You know, how embarrassing that would be for me and the type of impression he would have on me, you know? So with, with, with all of these guys coming back, I, I was always made sure to, to pay my respects to the guys that came before. And again, in the NFL, obviously we're all, as far as the players go, we're under a union, so we're all a team, regardless of what team you play for. Like, I, I was always the guy that during the game, I mean, I'm going to play physical and I'm going to play um, with reckless abandon, but it's going to be all uh, through the rules, right? I'm not going to do anything dirty and try to hurt somebody or do anything past that because, again, we're, we're th this is a profession. I would hate to take some guy out and then now he's not able to provide for his kids. But along with that, I always had a lot of respect for the fans, regardless of where we're going. Because most of the time, I, I, I loved road games, man. I loved being, you know, in a stadium where you had 80,000 people just, you know, just against you. And all you had was your, you know, the guys on your sideline. And I remember during games, you know, fans would say stuff. And I'd interact with the fans. And 99% and of the time after you, after the game, those same fans that we were going back and forth with, I go up and hey, a nice game, man, and become friends with them, you know. So getting on here, you know, obviously I started with with just kind of Raiders content, but I I always love getting and I, I try to encourage the Raiders fans uh, and some of the content creators to get other, you know, 49ers content creators and Eagles content creators and, and Houston content creators because that way sometimes when you just get stuck in with one team. You you, you kind of get tunnel vision, right? You don't you yeah, don't you really... want to switch it up a little bit. That's, yeah. that's that's what I do with my network. You know, I do the NFC West network with the Cardinal fan. I do one with the Seahawks and the Rams. Yeah, we work, we work as a team. Uh, I do my best to network with any other fan base because sometimes I want to switch up and see what's going on. Yeah. Like for example, I want to see what's going on with your Raiders because you're one of those guys that keeps an eye on them and yep. has some good understanding. And speaking of Purdue, man, I've heard some. Some pro days and stuff coming up pretty soon, but uh, I heard that the Niners have met up with the tight end. Uh, oh, uh, with uh, Payne Durham. Yeah, I've heard some good reviews about him. I would say this: Payne Durham is a stud, man. That that dude, he's a he's a close friend of mine. Um, him and his family. Hey, Alfredo. Him and his family um, are great people. He's a he's a big kid. Now, I will say this: I watched his combine. He didn't have the best numbers. I mean, they were okay, but. I don't believe that, that combine thing. It, it, it's no it's overrated. Yeah. It's no indication of how a guy's going to perform as a player. Payne Durham is a, he, he is a stud player. He's, he's, he's a kid who prepares. He's a good block. He's a really, really, really good blocking tight end, but he also, he can make plays down the field. Um, he's just a gamer, man. So he's a guy I'd love 
to be honest with you, I mean, with us kind of getting rid of some of our tight ends, he's a guy that I wouldn't mind the Raiders picking up. And and uh, the the Purdue, we have uh, um, Aiden O'Connell, who's a quarterback, who who really, I mean, Aiden O'Connell is a kid who started off as a as a, as like the eighth. Uh, quarterback walk on and kind of like a Steve Young story, I guess. Yeah, and, and came out and and really performed very well. Uh, we have uh, uh, Corey Trice was a tall cornerback that we yeah. had uh, last season. If, if you're looking at his kind of stats from last year, he he came back from an injury from his junior year, so he didn't play as as well as he could have. He was still kind of nursing that injury a little bit, but he's a he's a guy that's played a lot of football. Six foot, he's all of six foot three. He's fast. He, Lengthy corner, yeah. Yeah, he, he's a great corner. Then another guy is Jalen Graham, who's that kind of hybrid outside linebacker slash safety type. Uh, another guy who I've been a fan of for a long time, uh, came from Detroit. Again, all of 6'3", uh, about 230, uh, makes plays, great tackler. And then Charlie Jones, a receiver that we had who transferred from Iowa uh, for his uh, fifth year, a guy who came out and just kind of lit the lit the college football world on, uh, or took it by a storm, man. And he ran a four 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 two four four fours at the combine. I knew he was fast. I didn't know he was that fast. So he is a he's that slot receiver, kind of that um, Wes Welker type guy, a guy that can make a ton of plays. Obviously, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna probably I try to stay as realistic as I can, even though they're Purdue guys. But I I really you like keep it real. Yeah, I really like these guys that are coming out. I mean, they're they're legit players. And again, if you watch the combine during their drills, they're talking about somebody else. They're not really highlighting these guys from Purdue. And, and I get it. I know that Purdue's starting to get a little bit of a name, uh, but they are guys that are going to come in and, and, and I think they're going to do really well. So any guy that you get from Purdue, I can guarantee you that they're going to, they're going to be doing the right thing. They're going to be hard workers. And if they get a shot, they get a chance. Uh, they're going to do well. I mean, for instance, uh, Xander Horvath last year was a seventh round running back from Purdue to San Diego Chargers. Dude had two touchdowns in his first two games, you know, as a seventh round fullback, right? Oh, and, fullback. I mean, yeah, he's a guy who's been producing for us. And and we've had some guys the last couple of years do really well from from uh from Purdue. So yeah, I remember um, like I remember like last year you brought up uh Carl Carloftis. So, yeah, one. George Carloftis, George yeah, Carloftis. City Chiefs, yeah, yeah. Another guy who had a you know, won a Super Bowl, a guy that I wish, uh, you know, with us not having, you know, uh, picking round one or two, I knew we probably wouldn't have a chance to get him. But uh, David Bell was a receiver last year. He I was solid about. for Cleveland too. Yeah, yeah. So there are some, yeah, but that that Payne Durham, you guys would love to have that guy. Blocking tight, and that's what they look at mostly. Yep. And that's yep. what he's done. So I'm looking at the film, and I see consistency out of his game. But um, Well, I saw – I was watching yesterday – who was, who was, um, it was, uh, it's, it's a, it's a podcast. So everybody had on, um, Kettle, Kittle, Kettle, Kittle. Oh, George. Kit, you mean, you mean George Kittle? Yeah. He, he's your tight end, right? For the 49ers. Yeah. yeah from Iowa. And, uh, he, they had him on, man. That dude's a, that dude was pretty cool. I, I've always, I've always respected him. Anyone coming from the big 10, I love, you know, and, and Iowa produces great tight ends. A lot of great I, tight ends. I was watching him on a, uh, on a show and getting a chance. Here's the thing too, is, is you give, you give players a platform to show you us to, to be able to show the fans who we are as people. Right. Because a lot of times, you know, you go to a stadium and you're, you're, you know, you're off and the guys are so far removed from you. A lot of times you're watching them on the jumbotron. You don't really, they have all, we have all these pads on, so you don't really get a chance to see us. So it's not like we're, it's like we're not even human beings, you know, and this allows us to take the helmets off and for people to really see how we are as human beings. And I think that that's great because I think sometimes, again, when you get to meet somebody and you get to make that connection with them, you, it, you and it, it's I think it's fun, funner. I don't know if that's a word or not, but it's funner to when you know somebody and you watch those guys, it, it makes the game more enjoyable. You know what I mean? To have that personal connection with them. And for me, getting a chance to meet the fans on a personal level really helped me understand sometimes. Cause there were times with the Raider nation where, <clears throat> I mean, I'm thinking like these guys, these guys are nuts, man. I mean, they're like, I remember my rookie year, we go to Indianapolis and coming from, you know, Purdue, which is in Indiana. 
I'm like, I, I know how the fans are. They're 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 pretty respectable fans, and we're we're playing the Colts, and I hear these guys just yelling and yelling and yelling. I'm like, man, I didn't realize uh, Colts fan, Indiana fans, you know, were were kind of that that ruthless or whatever. And then about the third quarter, I finally turn around, and and there's 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 these two fans getting kicked out for talking trash to us, and they're both wearing Raiders jerseys. And I'm like, here we go. There's there's Raiders fans getting kicked out of a Colts game for talking trash to the Raiders team, right? And I'm like, what the heck, man? So it makes sense. Yeah. I'm like, I know they're passionate, but again, the real Raiders fans, those Raiders fans are are thinking that's how Raiders fans are. You know, where you go in, you talk crap, and the real Raiders fans, the real nation, getting a chance to really meet them on here. Um, I got a totally different respect for them. And the passion that you guys have, uh, and when I say you guys, all all fans, all fans, all fans, all fans that are going to take time out to, to to do stuff like this, I, I, I see why you guys are very passionate because you put a lot of time into it, and and it, it does become where when we lose or we win, you guys are a part of it. I always say that football is the greatest team sport because from the owner of the team down to uh, it's worst fan, right? Or it's, it's lowest fan. Every, every win and loss, they're all a part of it. There's each, each person has a higher percentage of what they're involved with, but that all comes together. I mean, it really does that fan support and, and, and the management and uh, practice squad guys and free. Everybody has a hand in every win and every loss. So uh, when, when I was able to come on here and meet the fans, it was great because I got a better appreciation of why sometimes they are so upset when a team loses because you guys put a ton, a ton of effort into representing the team and being behind the team. And I understand when, when, it, when, when they lose, you feel like you're getting let down. So it, it was nice to be able to, again, like this, this allows us to have these face-to-face conversations with before there'd be no way to have anything like this. You know, there'd be no, no way for, for someone who's not in the media to have a sit down interview with someone, you know, on, on, a, on an NFL team. No, I mean, some people just underestimate some of the fans and some perspective, yeah. but you've got some of the media credentials and all the guys who go their way and go a little extra mile. But like us, man, we, we just think differently, man. We just passionate about the team and guys like you who played this game and knows what it's, what it's like to be in this situation because you've, had to go through the locker room, the ownership, everything, dude. Like, it had to be something. Like, what was it like to just play for Al Davis, just meeting the guy in person? And it had to be something. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, he was – he obviously, I you know, I, I have a ton of respect for Al Davis. Um, I love Al Davis and, and his family and everything that they've done for me and for the Raiders and for the NFL and for – uh, I mean, he, he was a, he was a trailblazer. I mean, he did things that no other teams were going to do with hiring minority coaches and putting, you know, like a, a, a woman like Amy Trask in positions of power. And he, he, he did a lot of things that set trends. And um, he was a guy who was passionate, a guy who loved the sport, a guy who loved his players. Um, you know, again, I mean, he gave me an opportunity. Uh, I was every year kind of, there's, Al kind of has his picks in the draft and, you know, they could go through the whole entire off season of, 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 um, of draft research, right. Researching all these players and putting these draft boards together. And all of a sudden Al Davis, it, it could be during the draft, he comes in and he's like, well, okay, we're taking this guy. And they're going, you know, we talked, we heard talked about this guy a little bit, but you know, we had him here, 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 whatever. And I, I know, from 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 my agent that I was kind of Al's pick for that draft and just knowing that um, what was an honor for me and uh, here's kind of a here I want to show you something here's kind of a quick story here yeah it's a good story to know man so I guess he he wanted you as the pick interesting so so at the uh, the very first mini camp that we had when I talked about you know Willie Brown talking was after the draft. Um, the last period on Sunday was, um, you know, like a like a if the offense scores, camp's over with. If the defense stops, some camp's over with, and that's how we're going to end it. And I, 
I actually finished with a with an interception, and after we huddled everybody up, because Al Davis would go to he'd go to every practice. He was there at every every single practice. We filmed every single individual period, every T period, and he would go through and watch all of that. So it wasn't it wasn't a surprise to at you know 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night to to get a call from a private number and you answer it. And it's Al Davis asking you, hey, in that red zone period, how come you know you were so close to the line of scrimmage when you should have been towards the middle of the field or whatever? And I'm thinking, I don't even really remember what play he's talking about, you know. And then so he he watched every single every single thing going on. But after that, that interception, I heard, you know, Schwagger, Schwagger. And I look and it's Al Davis. And whenever Al Davis calls you over, it's it, it's Mr. Davis. Yes, Mr. Davis. He uh he he grabbed my here, he grabbed my jersey. And that at that time he could still walk, you know, without a that's sit. a good picture right there, man. That's gotta be something memorable to have for the remaining oh, of your life. Yeah, absolutely. So he uh, grabbed football the, Mavericks, man. The football maverick, the legendary guy, the pioneer of professional football. So he grabs that, he grabs that and and I walk like I'm he's using me kind of as balance to walk into the facilities. And he says, Oh, that he says, Swagger, that that ball always seems to find your hand, you know, and I'm talking with him. And it was a really cool moment. Well, my a close friend of mine, he said, Stu, because I when I went back my first off season, I uh we had a, a photographer, Tony. His name it was kind of funny, his name's Tony Gonzalez, but he was our team photographer. Oh, name it to the tight end. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. And uh, he gave me a CD of all the pictures he had taken. I mean, I, I would go to like Myers and print them off and, uh, you know, sign them for family and friends and stuff like that. And I, I signed one for, for a, a guy named Joe Wilson. And he said, Stu, you think you could take that back? And you think Al Davis would sign it? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. Cause I don't, I know I had heard that Al doesn't really sign a whole lot of stuff, you know? Um, it would have been something memorable to have as your, well, so I go back and I, 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 this is again, this is an off season and, uh, I go to his, his secretary's name was fudgy. And I said, fudgy, um, is Al around? And, and she says, yeah, he, he's in the office. I said, I said, Hey, do you think, I said, I have this picture. I said, do you think he would sign this? You know, it's, it's for a friend of mine. And she says, okay, I'll, I'll see. And she, you know, she gets on the phone and she puts it. She's yeah. I'll, he'll he'll see you now, and I you know these big double doors. And I open up his doors, and his his office is you know probably about the size, probably a little bit bigger than this basement, you know. And everything everything is is white. The carpets are white. The walls are white. Ceiling's white. All the furniture is like black marble, you know, black leather. And he says, "Swagger, come sit down." And I sit down. And as I'm sitting down, he's he says, "Uh, Stuart Swagger." Um, Heritage High School, 1,650 rushing yards, 25 rushing touchdowns, league MVP, 100-meter dash, uh, state champion, uh, junior. And he's going over, like, my high school. He's telling me my high school stats. And it wasn't like he was sitting there, like, knowing I was going to come into this office. Like, he had this, like, in the top of his head. Like a football geek. Yeah, I'm like – here I am. I'm I'm Stuart Schweiger. This guy's coached some of the greatest players ever, and he knows my high school stats. So that's just he was he was very passionate. Um, I think towards the end, though, it, it just got to the point where again, he he wants he owns the team because he loves football. And he 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 was a former coach, so he wanted things the way he wanted them ran. You know, I mean he's gonna bring in a coach and 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 really, when you bring in a coach, you got to let them coach. You know, you, you got to give them the, the freedom to do what they want. I mean, as the owner, you actually you have the trump card to, to veto anything. But I know, like, for instance, we would come in and – here, let me show you. Oh, I, I don't have it with me here. But um, I have all my old game plans. Um, you know, so you majority of your game plan goes in Wednesday and Thursday. Those are like – when you're putting in, these are the plays that we're going to run and why we're going to run them. Friday practice, that's just kind of a walk. You know, that's just kind of a, a refresher, kind of just, you know, you're not adding anything in. You're just doing review, getting ready to jump on the plane and head out. Well, Al Davis would have his meeting with Rob Ryan and his coaching defensive coaching staff Thursday night. So we come in Friday sometimes, Friday morning, 
And, you know, Rob would be up there and he said, I met with Al last night and he'd pull up our call sheet with all our calls and he'd say, all right, you know, we're not running in this. We're not running in this. We're going to run this, but we're going to call it this. Uh, we're going to, we're going to use this in, in this situation, but don't, don't let anyone know we're actually using that. So Al would come in and, say, and kind of dictate what the coach, like the plays we were going to run. And I think that just – that creates some controversy. I think that creates to where the, the coordinator is thinking like, well, it doesn't really matter what I do because Al is just going to change it anyways. And I think that's kind of where he may have gotten in trouble a little bit. I think because of that, towards the end, some of the coaches he hired were guys that he could kind of control a little bit more. because He was like the mad scientist trying to put in the ideas and all that. And, again, it – it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't like it was a deal where he was doing that out of out of spite or or what he was doing it because he thought what he was doing was the best to help the Raiders win. I mean that that was. His, I mean everything he did was to, to make the Raiders great. Um, but just towards the end, I think it just got to where you got to kind of you got to move on a little bit from some of your ideas. I mean. You know, on defense, I was pretty much just stuck 15, 20 yards deep in the middle of the field with our corners manned up, and and that can work. But in today's game, you still have to be able to make some adjustments, and I think that was where he he may have not been so apt to to move along with some of the changing times. And uh, sometimes when things, I think, weren't working for us, he wanted to stick with it because it had worked in the past. Um, but, again, a, a guy I have a ton of respect for, I love, and, and, and you know, what, what, what his family and, and I'm a huge supporter of Mark Davis and when he's done moving the team. And um, yeah, so I have, I have, we'll, we'll tell some stories some other time when I come on, but I have, I have some really good Al Davis stories. Yeah. I'm pretty sure maybe in the near future when it comes on your perfect timing, but um, we were about to cover the Jimmy Garoppolo. If you got maybe a little extra time for that. If that's yeah. Right. I got, I got about another, probably about a couple minutes here. Yeah. Okay. Let's cover the Jimmy Garoppolo. Cause I know this was a signing that some Raider fans weren't expecting and, I was kind of like saying I can see this happening because of the the fit with uh, Josh McDaniels. So I actually, I, I had actually said that he was a guy that kept coming up in my head when I thought of quarterbacks that we could get. I, I just I just looked at it thinking this 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 looks like something that could happen, you know, with McDaniels, and then just again with us taking a a, a great competitor from the Niners. Um, I love I love it. I absolutely love the pick. Um, I I was, as far as Derek Carr goes, I, you know, I, I support all the players. You know, there's some I like more than others. I just, with, with Derek Carr, I mean, here's a guy that for 10 years, I mean, I, I don't know how a player who, who, who for, can be there for 10 years, go through all those different coaching changes and continues to stay there and he's never won a, a playoff game. I mean, typically to have that type of job security, man, to be able to last through all that stuff, it's like this guy must be just he, – he is just such a great player for that team. <clears throat> I'm not saying he wasn't a, a great player because if you look at statistically, I mean, he, he in the record books he's considered one of the top, but that's because he was there so long. Yeah, um, and and he, he'll play – you know, 85% of the time he he's making great throws, great plays, but then sometimes he'll 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 make a play where you're like, what 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 was that? Like that was that that just came out of nowhere. And it's just like that little instability, like there that scared that always scared me because no matter how well he was playing, I'm thinking, dude, he's if he does one of those plays where you're going, what the hell was he doing? It could be the difference of a game. But I'm looking at it going 10 years, they paid the guy. Very well. Always had his back. Always, always, always never, never was negative towards him. And as soon as the Raiders make a decision just to, hey, you know what? We're going to, we're going to try Stidham here the last two games of the year, you know, not, 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 not being negative to him in the media, just saying, hey, we're going to take a look at this direction. What's the guy do? He, he leaves. Even though he's under contract, even though that he could be there in the in the in the he talks about how he's this great team guy, he could still be there being a backup towards Stidham, helping his team, you know, being another eye on the sideline. And what if Stidham goes out there and gets hurt? He could be right back there in the game and and and, and continue being the starter. And that that really kind of showed his true character. So 
that's that's the last I want to talk about Carr. So when Garoppolo comes, to me, oh, I, well, I do want to say this too. Um, in the NFL, th- there's a certain standard you hold. Your- <laughs> the, the NFL is a is a is a is a brutal, tough sport, and there's a certain way you you conduct yourself. In- <laughs> There's a certain type of attitude you have to have. On top of that, when you play for the Raiders, there's a there's a, another standard that you're kind of held to as far as being being a, a guy who 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 you know the Raiders have a have have that that uh, tradition of kind of being outlaws and this and that. And Carr was our head of our team, right? He was our representative, and when he was up on the stage, I don't know what it was doing post game interviews. <laughs> you know, week 13 or 14 or whatnot. And he's up there crying. And I, I cry, I cry in the locker. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm an emotional guy, but there's certain things you keep private with your teammates. And there's other things that you, as, 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 as a professional in the league and as a quarterback and as a leader of the Raiders to be up there and kind of pout in and, and whining, it just doesn't look good at all, at all. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, emotional for some players. It's not normal for everybody else. But when he said that I put a lot of this for this team and it's not good enough, and I mean, to be fair with, with him, he didn't have much of a great defense. Well, I mean, I don't want to get into all that right now. Yeah. Let's uh, get on to Jimmy Garoppolo. Man. Our, yeah, our defense did – our defense as far as what – they put our team in positions to win those games. They did. They gave us a chance. They definitely gave us a chance. So – but again, I just again, I'm not saying anything bad about being emotional. Like I said, I I I cry when I'm happy. I mean, I cried many times. I I I get so emotional before games. I'd cry just to get fucking ready, right? But again, yeah. you hold you like you you need to you need to do things in a certain way. When I saw Jimmy come in and do his you know his 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 interviews, his welcome stuff, to me, he's a Raiders quarterback. He he's he's a guy that carries that type of attitude carries that kind of um, swagger a little bit as as a guy that I think is represents the Raiders very well, a guy that we need, a guy that I think is a guy that players um, are going to like, teammates are going to like. Um, I think just the fans are going to love him, the environment that he's in. Um, I've respected him as a, as a player. I mean, I, I think he's a guy who has the talent level to do it. He's a guy who has the moxie to do it. I think he's a guy who um, wears his emotion on his sleeve. I think he's a guy that, uh, you know, this is this is what I do good. This is what I do bad. Um, and I think him getting back with McDaniel's, uh, I think that's a comfort level both for McDaniel's and him. Um, I don't think McDaniel's and Carr really meshed as well as they should have. And right now, I think these guys have a great relationship. And I think it's, I, I mean, obviously, right now everything's positive. You know, I mean, there's going to be some negative things that come to it. But I'm, I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm a I'm a Jimmy G fan, man. I was a Jimmy G fan of him because, again, I he's a guy that I would like to hang out with. You know, he's a guy that I think if he was on my team, he'd be he'd be a guy that I'd like to 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 go, uh, you know, to be to be uh, a friend of mine. You know, and that's kind of that's how I kind of judge how I like got a teammates is 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 this a guy that I would like to hang out with? And I think I think he is going to be um, he represents the Las Vegas. Las Vegas, Las Vegas Raiders, very well. I, he he's a guy that that I think is a perfect fit for us. Now, could he go I mean, out? Durability, durability has been his issue, but other yeah. than that, seventy percent of his games he's been winning like consistently. Like, I mean, what else can you expect from a quarter? Well, yeah, well, let me ask you this. I mean, you know, you know about him better than I do. What's your what's your what's your take on him? How do you feel about the guy? Proven winner, just doesn't win the big one. But when you give him the better talent around him and he can stay healthy, this guy can win you games consistently. That's that's what makes Jimmy so good in it the rest of the way, bro. It's like if you give him the talent, you give him the supporting cast, this guy's going to ball out. And it's – you do like I thought when you guys got rid of Waller, I thought that was the dumbest move, like to be honest. But you guys got two tight ends. You got Austin Hooper yeah, and O.J. Howard. I don't know, dude. Like, I think something's going on with, with McDaniels. But, hey, I'd like to give a shout-out to your boy, Doxon, man. Dox is in the chat. Oh, hey, what's up, Dox? Good to see you, brother. Um, he, he, That's funny that you bring in Dox as, as you talk about Waller. I've had my issues with Waller, and 
you talk about someone who has has who's injury prone. The last couple of years, he he's been on the sideline a lot, and all he's done during his time, instead of instead of just being quiet, grinding, and getting back healthy, he's a guy that's always been complaining, wanting this, wanting that. And then when you give him a chance to show off what he can do, he's had some games where he's lost some games for us. So I'm I'm completely fine with 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 him going. And and when I look at Jimmy G, I mean I gotta say he's. He's got some weapons, right? I mean, if you look, weapon, yeah, the, the weapons are outstanding. Like you got the receivers, yep. two tight ends. Yep. That's for anything better. Yeah. And then with our running back and our offensive line getting better and then adding some guys around. So I, I think I think Mark's gonna give him every opportunity uh to be the best that he can be. So um again, I'm 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 excited. I'm very very excited for, to have him come in and see what he can do. Yeah, for sure, man. Hey, we'll definitely keep you posted, man, for yeah. maybe down the road, man. I know you probably got some stuff to do, but uh, hey, it's been fun to chit chat with yeah, you. Yeah, I definitely, no, I definitely, I, I, I love what you do. Um, I love the content that you create. I love the fact that you give guys a platform to, to, to one, introduce ourselves as, as, as human beings, right? Like, it's, it's not always about, football you know sometimes outside of football is what i yeah yeah some i think some of these shows it's it's you know it's like how 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 long and how much longer can we talk about well what if we draft this guy what if we do this and that it's like man let's 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 maybe talk about and and, and again as a fan base i encourage i i kind of give the like i told the raiders fan base here is it's no other teams you know sometimes they go i don't care about other teams i'm a raiders fan it goes well the more you know about other teams, the better Raiders fan you can be. Because I think when these teams would come in and it's, hey, are the Raiders going to win? Yeah, we want the Raiders to win every game. Is it going to happen? No. But I think when you know the other teams a little bit more, you can give a better evaluation of what you think is going to happen in that game. So I encourage all the fans, if you are, you know, you have your base team, but go on and, and, and look at some other content creators because those guys are going to know like you know the 49ers. I mean, I know a little bit about them, but if I if 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 I'm gonna do a show and the Raiders are playing the 49ers, you want my info. <laughs> I want your info. Yeah, I want you, I want your evaluation. And sometimes it's nice just to have someone else come on and say, Hey, what do you think about what the Raiders are doing? Seeing an outside uh, well, uh view oh, yeah. on outside looking in, I think what the Raiders are building with Jimmy Garoppolo is they're building that formula. Like, you know, yeah. if it if it worked in New England with him, why not with Las Vegas? If it's worked with San Francisco, it's all about building this office. Like, I think McDaniels can build up his strength. Like, you know, Shanahan did the same thing. Yeah. I think yeah. it's gonna probably be the same, but it, it, the question is is durability, man. Can the guy stay healthy? Well, I will say this one of the things that uh, <laughs> I got a little I got a little crap from my Raiders fans because I, I got back into, um, you know, one of the things I want to do was, was to get back into like some hobbies and, and whatnot. And one of my things I got back into was playing Madden. And when I went online, I, uh, uh, I was actually, I, my, my team I was using was the 49ers. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I told the Raiders that they're like, what the hell? And I'm like, ah, so I actually, I actually, I have been using the Raiders, but I do use the 49ers offense and defense, but I use the 49ers at first because their defense was so good. And that's whenever I'm picking a team, man, I really based by their talent wise. Yeah. I loved, I loved your guys' defense. Um, uh, I thought I, I, you guys have, a, you guys have a very, very, very good team. I, I liked watching you guys. Um, so I, I have respect for the 40. I mean, I have respect for all the teams. I mean, there's yeah, Keith Lewis was a good one you liked. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. You know, like I said, I played with Jeff Garcia, man, and Jeff Garcia was was a great, great, great teammate. And obviously, you know, Ronnie Lott, Ronnie Lott was a guy that um I actually have some interviews where Ronnie Lott's giving me some praise uh after one of the games, which was really cool. So um, yeah, no, I I always enjoyed the 49ers and um, I, I'd probably say the team that probably irks me the most is probably the Kansas City Chiefs, I guess. I mean, I always – but, again, I guess when it comes down to it, I always – if a team's going to win and it's not our team, I'd like it to be a team from our division. At least I think it, it gives the division uh, credibility and stuff like that. So it's just like, a, you know, during bowl games, I always want anybody from the Big Ten to do well. So um, – but, again, no, yeah, I, I just – 
I told that and I got some pretty big flack for it. So now I, I do strictly just use the Raiders now when I play. <laughs> because play. you've been getting caught up on that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't blame you, man. I don't blame you. But in all yeah. seriously, bro, it was fun, bro. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, anytime, bro. We were we were going with the mental health stuff. We were going a little bit of all the other stuff, and it went on for like almost an hour, bro. I will, I, say, that, I will say this just just so you know, and I and uh, the I do go on tangents, so we might start talking about one thing and end up on another. But that's not with me. I think that's a good. I really do. I think that's a good change up because again, sometimes you can only talk so much about the football side of it. And um, but again, I, I appreciate you having me on, and we'll definitely. We'll definitely do this again, and I'd love to have you on my show as well sometime. Yeah, send me an invite or send me the link next time. Maybe I'll jump on your show some other time. Definitely, definitely. All right, bro, have a good one. For everybody else, thanks for tuning in. This is former Raiders safety and former Purdue standout Stuart Swagger. Go check out his channel. Tell everybody where they can find your channel. Uh, it's just Stuart Swagger uh, on YouTube. Um, I got I, I, my other hand. I, I do have a Instagram. I do have a – well, let's see here. Let me just let me look. I have uh, my Instagram is Stuart Swaggert 30. Uh, that's S T U A R T S C H W E I G E R T. Then the number 30. Uh, my Facebook is just Stuart Swaggert. And then my Twitter is uh, Stuart Swaggert at Thy Butcher 9. So T H Y B U T C H E R 9. And uh, yeah, and I. I, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll talk football. Sometimes I'll talk whatever. I mean, I, I love having on uh, different subjects, uh, talking about life, talking about, I like everything, fringe, everything. Yeah. Everything, man. So yeah, everything you know, in general, like you even I, had some hangouts sometimes, even though it's more yep. majority of the Raiders, but sometimes you just go in there to chit chat. They'll just. Like, yeah. And, and again, I, I love, if anybody else has, again, this is kind of my, this is my free time here. You know, I mean, with me being, with me, with my my different issues again, like where I don't go out a lot, um, you know, I am with my family quite a bit. This is my opportunity to, to kind of go out. This is my social life. So if anybody else ever want, reach out to me, man. I, I love coming on people's shows. It just doesn't have to be about Raiders. It can be about you know college football, pro football, whatever. It's too, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, anything, anything. So again, I, I appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, anytime, bro. And thank you, Stu, for tuning in on the show. And it's looking forward to the near future, man. We'll definitely catch up. Sounds good, man.